Hello everybody, welcome to the Football Daily Weekly. Pleasure to have you with us. Lawrence is here. Hi. And Dave is here Hi. as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about the five things we learned from the weekend's footballing action. First up, Harry Kane is still the best player on the planet. <laughs> Give him the cane. Lawrence. No, he's the most enjoyable player to watch on the planet. That doesn't make him the best. Okay. Yeah. Like someone who's won a competition to play for Spurs. Say an Arsenal supporter who's won a... No, but what I'm saying is, does that not make sense to you? He's... He's a really lovely player to watch. He is. Um, and people are really hyping him up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Who? Everyone oh, in yeah, the press? Probably. You? <laughs> this guy over here with his stats? Um, well, let's see if he does have some stats. Yeah, do you? To, uh, I think it's, he's, he's in form at the moment, isn't he? He's yeah. red hot form. He's got yes. 12 goals in the league, Premier League this season. 22 in all competitions, though. Which Dave. is absolutely brilliant. So he scored more goals than any player under 21 or under in Europe's top five leagues. So that's absolutely outstanding. It was a great win for Spurs, of course. Yeah. And Harry Kane was the main man. But they had good performances all over the pitch, Lawrence. Yeah, yeah really good performance. Pochettino's done a lot to this side. And I think he really out, outthought uh, Wenger tactically. Arsenal are really flat, though. And it Spurs, is. Spurs constant pressure. You wonder, can they keep that up for an, for an entire season or all the way into the run? Because that was pressure all the way through the game. I'd say so, yeah. I think the big Dembele, really, I thought he got a, you know, he beat his man, he beat Coquelin. It was a big test for Coquelin. And I think Dembele had the better of that battle. Mm. And then, obviously, with Christian Eriksen floating around and coming inside, Coquelin didn't really have the best of games. He wasn't outstanding. He didn't, you know, make a massive impact like he did against Man City. Mm. So it was an interesting one. I think Eriksen, for me, was the best player on the pitch. Yeah. Created five chances more than any other player on the pitch. And he's just one of those players that's so good to watch at the moment when he's in form. He's brilliant to watch. Scored more goals than any midfielder under 23 in Europe's top five leagues. So he's one of those players that's really making a difference for Spurs at the moment, I'd say. Uh, what about Arsenal? They look, didn't look I think great. It was, a bit, it was a bit odd. Obviously, against Man City, they, they came to defend and they defended very well. I don't think that approach should have been taken against Spurs. Mm. Spurs like having the ball. They like playing with the ball. If you take the ball away from Spurs, it makes them a little bit more ineffective. In the game earlier on in the season, Spurs-Arsenal, it balanced out where Spurs were counter-attacking. It was a good game. Arsenal were on top. Arsenal should have taken the, you know, should have taken the initiative in this game and dominated it. Mm. They had less possession than Spurs. I think that was a big error on Wenger's part. He kind of misjudged the situation, in my personal opinion. Do you think mm. one of them will finish in the top four or both of them? <sighs> At the moment, Spurs are looking, you know, Pochettino, he's got to be one of the managers of the season. You know, changing Southampton and making them into a very good side and now doing the same at Spurs. It's taken time for his style to go through, but now it's just, it's brilliant to watch. Louis van Gaal still doesn't know his best 11 for Manchester United, does he, Dave? I don't think so. This no. irked you, this performance, didn't did it? Did it? It really did. It got, got into the cracks of a, a season that's been very poor. It's not mm. been good watching Man United this season. Again, playing the 3-5-2, now playing this diamond. It's all very narrow. Just get rid of Moyes. Very, oh. very <laughs> congested. <laughs> where, was, where was Wayne Rooney in that diamond? The thing with Wayne Rooney is I've always been the person that he is a number nine striker. Mm. He, that is him, his game. He isn't, he isn't technically, he's, he isn't good enough. I'm going to say it now, he's not good enough. For, uh, to be a midfielder. To be a midfielder. He doesn't have the right pass selection. He only completed 40 passes against West Ham, which is quite poor. Mm. You want a central midfielder in a dominant team to be around 70, to be around 80, to be around 90 completed passes. I think Wayne Rooney needs to go back up front. I think he's our best number nine. For the last two, three seasons, he's been in the side to score goals or to get assists. And that's what he's been doing. That's his output. He's got over 200 goals from Manchester United. That's, 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 that's fair enough. That feeds into what Dave's saying. Yeah, exactly. His performance hasn't been there for a number of seasons. Since he was playing up front on his own, you know, when we got to the Champions League final, that season he was absolutely class. And then since Van Persie's come in, you know, he's, he's dropped off and he's not the main man anymore. Wayne Rooney has to be the main man. More, credit to Moyes, kind of brought him back and he said, right, Rooney, you're my main man again. Van Gaal may potentially have done that with the captaincy, but now he's, he's playing him in the wrong position. What Louis van Gaal is expecting from his team is a much more European approach. Mm -hmm. uh, look at his previous sides. Look mm -hmm. at the likes of the Netherlands. Look at um, anyone that he's won the league with, anyone mm -hmm. that he's done particularly well with. They're very adaptable. Um, their, their teams are able to uh, switch positions quite easily. If you look at him against West Ham, he tactically tinkered and tinkered and tinkered, which may be he might learn is something is mm. more difficult to do in the Premier League. But ultimately, it paid off for him. They got that goal. But right now, United seem to be papering over cracks and not remembering or at least playing some, to some of their greatest strengths. They used to be a great counter-attacking side. Yeah. Very little counter-attacking in this game because there doesn't seem to be very much pace in the side that they, they utilise. Counter-attacking is not just about the pace. It's about the position of the player exactly. on the break. But the, the, what but we really lack in is that. Pace. That's it. We've got Jan Azai and, and Di Maria, again, mentioned those two players, and Valencia, that are all absolutely rapid, yet we're playing this narrow system that's so congested in the middle and there's no out ball. Lawrence, why is Van Gaal not getting more criticism? He's, he's European and therefore, and, and also people fear him. People have looked at his track record and said, well, 
that's impressive. Van Gaal is very good at controlling the media in the same way that Mourinho is. And mm. Mourinho learned a lot from him in that sense, mm, yeah. didn't he? Mm-hmm. The, 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 the constantly taking little snipes at journalists, not answering the right questions, those kind of things. And he knows he can give people copy or not. When all said and done, though, Dave, obviously the season's not finished. Manchester United are currently in fourth. Has Van Gaal been a success so far this season? Or should we wait to the end of the season? Wait to the end of the season. <laughs> <I think> he needs <laughs> I to you'd tinker say that. more. <laughs> and he's the wingers back. And then I think it'll be, it'll be fine from there. But he, mm. he does need to change his system again. He needs to admit failure, which will be difficult for him, mm-hmm. I imagine. But he's got to go, go through it and push through a new system. 4-3-3 or 4 2 three, one or we're not going to make top four. Absolutely. Lawrence, what about Van Hal? Uh, obviously, obviously, the end of the season is always that cliched answer. Um, but I would say, uh, no, relatively, he has not been a success. Because if you look at the amount of money that he spent, you look at where they would like to be in the table, mm-hmm. you look at the history of what United has tried to do in recent years, they should be higher up at this point in the cycle of the team. Um, 44 points in the fourth place, that's relative failure. But they're not out. No. Essentially, that's the great thing about Van Gaal, is he can create a mentality which will keep them in that position. So he'll be clinging on to that, that fourth spot at this point. And with Man City dropping points as well, yeah. they should perhaps be looking to try and catch them. Because if he finished above Manchester City, that would be considered a, a success, surely. Five point 100%, gap. Yeah. Five mm. point gap. That's makeable. Real Madrid cannot beat Atletico Madrid at the moment, Lawrence, can they? They're decimated. Oh, my God. Oh, very good, sir. Very good. Four nil. Simeone. Um, uh, so smart. Have you seen all, this, the, all the little memes of him post-game? Like, Yeah, he can't get enough of it. The trouble is, of course, the one they did lose um, to Real Madrid was the Champions League final. But since then, it's been six matches. Not this but, season, though, is it? Yeah. No. Yeah. They're getting their revenge, yeah. slowly um, but surely. Not slowly, quickly and fastly. Well, yeah. And in a good way, Lee. Right? <laughs> they, is something swinging in Madrid oh. at this point in the season, which takes it back towards Atletico? Y- y- indeed. Yeah. I mean, what about Simeone, though? I think it's been absolutely brilliant. I think yeah. it's taken a bit of time for him to adjust this team again and you know, move the team on. It was over-reliant on Diego Costa. Personally, I didn't actually enjoy watching Atletico last year. I thought they were very rugged and a, a little bit just brute force Yeah. This season is completely different. I think with Mandzukic up front, he's such a workhorse. It's so great to watch a striker that chases down the opposition. He won five tackles in the game. Really? Which is incredible, considering no player in yeah, the league won more tackles that weekend. <laughs> right. And I think defending from the front, defending from the front is brilliant. And his partnership with with Griezmann is you like Griezmann. Is really good. I really like Griezmann. Yeah. I think he's he's taken a while to settle in. Mm. He played his first full ninety minutes on the twenty first of December, so it's taken him a while to get up to Simeone's speed. But now he's harrying, he's pressing, he's scoring goals. Only uh, Neymar, Messi, and Ronaldo have scored more goals in the league this season than Griezmann. He's changed from being a being a midfielder to a real poacher, sort of playing on the back of uh, Mandzukic flick-ons, and it's a really nice. It's an old school partnership, a big man and a little man. It's just great to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Some people in um, in Madrid, Dave, are saying that Ancelotti, the goodwill of the goodwill, the good performance of winning the tenth uh, European Cup is slightly uh, beginning to wane a little, despite them being top of the league, only by a point though, but top of the league, and in the Champions League as well. I think with Ancelotti, he's a cup manager, he likes to win his trophies yes. in, in the cups. His league form with AC Milan wasn't that great. Mm. Um, they did win the league though. They won the league, I think they won the league once in, in five seasons, but obviously they competed very, very highly in the Champions League, which is sort of like how Real Madrid are coming. You can kind of see the wheels falling off. I think the squad isn't good enough. I don't think the squad is good enough. Real Madrid squad isn't good enough. I think that it's not good defensively. Okay. Around. So you're looking at the central midfield. They've got a lot of options, but they're coming to the end of that right now with Modric out, James out. You know, Ronaldo was out the game Cruz. before through suspension. Cruz is an interesting one. I think he's being played out of position, and he's not. I think he's being underutilized, playing a defensive midfield. Too role. deep. Too deep. Yeah. Ira Mendy. Ira Mendy should be playing the role that Cruz is playing, and then Cruz should be playing further forward. It seems a bit. A bit strange at the moment. It seems like Ancelotti and Nilo Mendy might have fallen out. Other things with, I don't think Varane is as good as everyone makes out. I think against Atletico Madrid, he was properly exposed. He made a number of pretty big mistakes that were just sort of, you know, if he was as good as people make out, he wouldn't be making those mistakes. He'd be more mm. consistent. He's young, mate. He, he is young. So what I mean with depth in, in defence is the centre-backs. They don't have a lot of cover. They've got Pepe, Ramos, Varane and then Nacho. Cristiano Ronaldo was berated for celebrating his 30th birthday after that performance. He's not been very nice recently, has he? He's, he hasn't earned that. Despite living on the planet for 30 years, they lost, so he shouldn't be celebrated. Do you that, agree? That Tresimmer? There you go. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, he, uh, or at least he shouldn't have done the karaoke. Is that what we're thinking? Yeah, that's what we're thinking. Yeah. Because the karaoke was a step too far. Yeah, right? If they'd have lost only 2-0, karaoke fine, but beyond 2-0, no karaoke. Good point, mm. yeah. 
And I think that should be written into the contract in many ways. Mm. Manchester City's home form is going to cost them the league title, Lawrence. Would you agree? I mean, they've not won their past four league games. And at uh, home, they look like they're, um, they're a bit rickety. Yeah, at times. Mm. Uh, although that would be, I think a lot of that forms down to the lack of Yaya Torre in the midfield. 100% down to the lack but of Yaya Torre. Is that one player with a squad 100%. that good? You just said 100%. Did think, he? I think yeah. so. So obviously since he's gone to the African Cup of Nations, they've played four games, drawn three, lost one. They should be able to beat Burnley and Hull. They should be, but what yeah. Yaya Torre gives them is that he dictates the play and that's what they've been lacking. So against uh, Hull at the weekend, Gail Clichy completed the most passes on the pitch. Yeah. So their left back completed the most passes. Usually Yaya Torre's smashing 20 more than any other player on the pitch. So the likes of Nazari, the likes of Silva, haven't stepped up in this period to become that dictator. Potentially from deep is where they're lacking. They've got Fernando and, and Fernandinho, who are all right players, but you're not going to say that Yaya Torre-esque. I think Yaya Torre is explosive. He can change the tempo of a game. He's just got it all. He's a complete midfielder. And if you take someone that out, out your side, then it, it is going to sort of cost you, I think, in the league. Do you know things a bit... I mean, I, I totally take your point, Dave. Do you know things a bit ridiculous, Lawrence, with, with the size... With that amount of money, with that amount of talent in it, you take one player out and it's so, so costly for them. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Mm. And you'd certainly say that they, they should be more tactically adaptable than that. And that falls onto the players who Dave, yeah. Dave's already listed. Mm. And, and the manager as well. And the manager, which is why some people are saying that it could cost him his job at the end of the season, which mm. is interesting to hear. You, you could argue as well that potentially if Aguero hadn't been injured and hadn't been coming back from injury now... And then Yaya Torre had gone away. If Aguero was on the, the, you know, the form at the start of the season, potentially that would have been all right. He would have kept scoring those goals. He would have been kept making things happen. You know, hit the bar against Hull City. So maybe if that had co coincided in a nicer way, City would be doing a lot better. But I think they are very dependent on Yaya Torre if Aguero isn't firing all cylinders. They also get Bonnie back from the African Cup of Nations, which will be interesting to see how he fits into this side. That does give them another option up there, which maybe takes the impetus of the team further ahead. Whereas before, it, the the... Essentially, the, 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 the edge was Yaya Torre in midfield. And then just ahead of that, they sort of played through him. Now it's Bonnie back, possibly. And, and that gives them a bit more stretching. It's going to be brilliant to see to watch two small strikers. That's what you want to see in world football. They can press, they can harry, they can get the ball down. Wilfred Bonnie is a brilliant footballer. Mm. So that could be, you know, next season, if we're looking into the future, potentially it might take them too long to adjust back from the African Cup of Nations. It usually takes the players a good month or two. It's a strange one to get back into the, the form. Bear that in mind. So. Then they're going to be partying for two days. <laughs> so then they're going to have to have a week off, chilling out. There and then karaoke. Karaoke, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Ronaldo thing, you know. Speaking of the Africa Cup of Nations, Ivory Coast finally won it. the first time since 19... 92. Not quite the golden generation of, uh, of, of recent tournaments, but kind of a mix of, of the golden generation and the, and the new generation. Lawrence, were you pleased for them? Yeah. I was no, going to say, you can't really say no to that. No, I'm not well. pleased. Well, you could have preferred Ghana to win, perhaps. I, I like them both. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed the way the penalties played out. But My God, it was a boring game, but what a penalty shootout. I thought it was an interesting game. It really? Seemed to, yeah, it seemed like such um, a contrast of... Uh, sort of what we know as African football, mm. which is stereo, you know, stereotypical, but also like a very much more European-looking style of stalemate. Well, actually, if you look at the, the finals of the African Cup of Nations, I think only three goals have been scored in the last six finals so of, the, of the tournament. So that uh, you say stereotypes, but actually, stereotypically, the final is quite a dull affair. Yeah, five of the last nine finals have, have ended up in a penalty to shootout. Yeah. So it's. Well, they need to improve. They need to improve their finals, <laughs> open it up a bit. But I think there might be too much pressure on them. Mm. The penalty shootout was absolutely incredible. Was Ivory good. Coast, they looked like they were going to throw it away yeah. again. And they lost, of course, um, uh, to Zambia in the final in 2012. Harvey, Harvey Renard, Zambia. And then there he was on the, on the touchline, the cool as you like, in that white shirt. Oh, yeah. 17 games unbeaten, Harvey Renard in that white shirt in the African Cup of Nations, Lawrence. They came good, through. What strength Ivory Coast showed to, to turn that penalty shootout around? Yeah, and Barry in goal was. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. mean, he was play acting and all sorts, but yeah. but he was the difference. Very, very dramatic. I think at times there's that sense of drama that you get about the, mm. the penalty shooter, and it's added because it's in the African Cup of Nations, mm -hmm. because they haven't won it in such a long time, because Jovino was choosing to look away, because the Ghanaian players were on the halfway line, all of them arms around each other, you know, getting down on their knees every time they missed. It was it, there was a real drama about it, and I enjoyed mm. that. I also thought. The bravery of some of those penalties mm. was absolutely fantastic. There was some top corner ones. <laughs> who, sorry, who took the third penalty that scored? For it, who? It was uh, for, for Dumbia. Coast. Yeah, mm. just stepped up. And the previous two, bear in mind, have missed by quite a margin. And then, you know, obviously, and it just right up into the yeah. top corner. I thought Eric Bailey's, uh, yeah, that, that I've, I've already, I think he's the fullback, 
two steps, dum. And that was in sudden death. And Colo Torre. Colo Torre, because he missed against uh, Zambia, yeah. I think it was a, a crucial one. Ghana have now lost eight penalty shootouts in their last ten. Which is, which is what, English-esque. What are, to, what are you supposed to say about that? What can you say about losing? Well, you can, you can say that they don't hold their nerve. You can also say that if you've had 10 penalty shootouts, then maybe you need to play better in the match. Well, well not necessarily. If you look at the Germans, for example, broadening the picture, you know, they've been involved in many a penalty shootout and they've only ever lost one in their history. They, may, they maybe need to, like you're saying, they may need to look into it. Zambia, apparently they were singing the, the national anthem when they were going up to take the penalties. Really? So it took their mind off the situation. Yeah. And that's sort of the psychology behind why they potentially might have won. Mm. It's quite Interesting with Avram Grant, he's now been the runner-up in the African Cup of Nations, yeah. Champions League, Premier League, League Cup and FA Cup. Uh, Poor guy. Yeah. The nearly man. The nearly man. The nearly man. But you know, Harvey Renard, when he, when he wears the white shirt, you're never going to beat that. No. He's the everyman. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching everybody. Thanks to Lawrence and Dave. Let us know what you thought or what you learned in the weekend's action in the comments below. And we'll see you on Thursday for our Q&A session.